Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, host uh, in this uh, Maasai seminar that we moved a bit so that everyone could participate because I remind uh, Friday is a holiday. Every week, uh, some, some member of the group are surprised by the number of holidays we have. Uh, um, and so Pietro uh, is a PhD student in University of Cambridge, close to the end. Uh, and he's going to present a, a very nice work uh, he has been leading and, and some of us have been a bit uh, involved in and that uh, just been accepted to uh, NERIPS uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, he's going to talk about concept embedding models uh, and I think it can uh, interest um, a lot of people from the different uh, perspective. So Pietro, the floor is yours. Thank you for the, for the introduction and uh, thank you for hosting this talk. Uh, please interrupt me at any point if something is unclear and I will try to do my best to answer your questions. So today we are talking about concept embedding models, um, but before diving into the details, I want to give you a bit of introduction uh, of uh, the broader context where concept and concept based models um, fall into. So the outline of the of this talk uh, would concern explainable explainable AI as, at first. So I will try to give a brief introduction of what this field is. Uh, then we are going to talk in specific about concept learning, which is a subfield in explainability. And at last we are uh, we will be talking about concept bottleneck models, which um, as novel approach to explainability, which uh, uses concepts to make decisions. And um, the problem we are going to talk today uh, within this field would deal with um, the accuracy explainability trade-off, which is probably one of, one of the most interesting open challenges in, in, the, in the field of explainable AI, and um, which is a challenge that can be summarized with this graph. Uh, on one axis, for example here the x-axis, uh, you represent how explainable your model is, and on the y-axis how accurate your model is. And the problem is that most neural networks uh, are very accurate, but they are not explainable. You cannot understand how they work. So on the x-axis, they, they, they fall short. Um, while some more explainable models struggle to achieve the same performance of uh, neural networks. And the optimal situation would be on the top right, where you have optimal uh, accuracy and explainability. And this would be the goal of um, uh, explainable AI in general and of this talk in particular, trying to achieve this top right corner uh, of the optimal compromise. So a step back, as I said, uh, let's start with explainable AI, just a brief introduction. Uh, explainable AI deals with uh, explaining what models do. So let's start with a simple question. What does an image represent? Like this image represents an apple. If you ask uh, to any child what this means, like the answer is easy. And in the last uh, few decades, uh, we managed to achieve impressive results with neural networks, which are now able to answer the same question. The problem is if you change the question a bit, if you try to understand a bit more about this problem and trying to understand what the, the, the agent is doing, and um, if you ask, for example, a child what, what, why the child thinks that this is an apple, like you can get something like this, like an apple is a round and red fruit, like an like easy, easy answer. If you ask an agent, a machine learning agent, then then it's a problem. Like, um, especially with deep neural networks, it's not easy to understand why they think an image represents a specific object. 
And this is more or less the motivation for explainability. We want these agents to be able to answer these kind of questions. And like just to summarize a bit more formally what, explainab what explainability is, uh, we are using this formalism, uh, formalism uh, borrowed by category theory, which um, is called string di diagrams to represent the agents we are talking about. Like this kind of agents um, we call S, like they have some input, they have an output, and they update their parameters. Um, so the, the S is the model, and explainability deals with an external agent that is observing the, the agent S, and it tries to predict the output of S, of S looking at the input of S and uh, its parameters. So this task um, can be again formalized in a bit more in with string, string diagrams where now we have um, the same uh, model S. Uh, we have another agent H, which is making the same predictions, taking the same inputs, and we have a divergence um, between the predictions of uh, the machine learning model and the human. Um, if this uh, divergence is mm, much higher than, than than zero, it means that the human didn't understood like uh, didn't understand very well what the machine learning model did. So in this case, we call the we refer to the machine learning agent S as a black box. Like a thing that a human cannot understand. And this is often the case where the, the size, the number of parameters we are using to model S is high. Like if we have a model with millions of parameters, like modern deep neural networks, um, it's not easy for a human to look at the parameters and the input and predict what the model is doing. And this is the main motivation, as I said, for explainable, explainable AI, which tries to uh, provide some explanations for why a model took a specific decision. And this is the formalization in, with st string diagrams of uh, an explainable agent. It, it's similar to S, but uh, it has an additional output, which is the explanation. And this is the kind of models we will be talking about in this talk. More specifically, we are talking about concept learning. So now we are talking, in the next few minutes, I will try to explain a bit more what a concept, what concept learning is and what concepts are. So if you, if you go back to the original question, what, like, why do you think this is, an this is an image representing an apple? We can decompose the answer of the child in, in a few terms. And we are going to focus on two specific terms, like, um, the adjectives this, you, we, the, the child can use to describe the apple, like round and red. Like, what, what's round and what's red? Well, what's the definition of what is round? Like, if you take a few things, like a tire, like a pizza or whatever, like, they have a similar shape. So a round is a shape, and uh, we can represent a round object with a circle, like something that like a general representation of, of, of something that, is, that has this kind of shape. And we can have a similar representation for, for red. And so more formally, if you take two sets, a set of, a sets, a set of objects um, like these ones and a set of attributes as red, green, round, or whatever, uh, a concept is a pair of objects and attributes. This is a formal definition of what a concept is. So red is the pair of all objects that have the label red. Easy. And the motivation for concept learning is that what human, humans do when they try to solve or explain what they do is they first map the problem into a concept, concept space um, which are attributes we use to describe uh, the, the word, and then use this information to solve the task. And what concept learning in, within the field of machine learning is trying to do, is trying to do the same thing for um, uh, machine learning agents. 
more specifically, within this field, we are looking at uh, concept bottleneck models. Concept bottleneck models have a specific structure in the, like, the architectures of, of concept bottleneck models is a specific architectures that is able to map concepts directly within the layers of the neural network. So first you have uh, what we call a concept encoder. A concept encoder is a function that takes the input and maps the input to a set of predefined concepts, like round, red, square, cold, whatever. And, and then we have a function we call label predictor that goes from the concept space to um, the task space. And together with the label predictor, we have um, another function that we call the explainer, which can be equivalent to the label predictor in some cases, but the explainer specifically extracts uh, the explanation for the prediction. Now, the one of the advantages of this um, of this model is that um, well, this is the formalization of the model. So uh, there is a first there is a first uh, first uh, morphemes uh, G and then uh, the label predictor F that has two outputs: the explanation and the prediction. But the nice property of this approach is um, emerges when the when concept bottleneck models provide wrong exp wrong predictions like imagine uh, this model predicts um that this image is red and squared we know this is not squared uh, but since the model like predicted that this image contains a square object it might predict that this image is representing a dice um what happens is that a human expert can have a, now have a look at the concept space. And the concept space is clearly wrong in, for, this, for this input. So the, the human expert can interact with the model and change the prediction of the concepts. And by interacting with the model dynamically, then uh, in changing the, the predictions of, for the concepts, now the model can solve correctly the task and predict that this image contains, in fact, an apple. And this is the formalization. Uh, we, with string diagrams, we can represent this with an additional morphism uh, row that is, f f works as a reparameterization repar of the concept space, where the, the human is uh, providing an, an extra supervision on, on the concept space at test time. And this reparameterization changes the prediction of the model G. And now we are, like, once we discuss this, we are ready to um, um, think, like, talk about what's not working with concept bottleneck models. And one of the main problems is the accuracy explainability trade off. So if you take a model without the con this concept space, um, that is the gray gray model in the top left corner. The accuracy of these models for some challenging tasks um, is very high, but the, the the like the kind of explanations you can extract is quite low, quite poor. Uh, while for standard concept bottleneck models, uh, like when they face challenging tasks, it's the reverse. The explanations you can get out of the model are nice but the model is almost random and the other problem with concept bot models is that they do not scale in real world conditions where typically you have noisy data and um, you don't have supervisions for many concepts uh, and on one side this could be because the, the super, supervisions are expensive to generate, like humans have to annotate concepts manually for providing these uh, supervisions during training. And on one side, on, on, on other con, in other contexts, uh, the ground truth concepts might be unknown even to humans. So humans cannot even provide this information because they do not know which what are the right concepts? Concepts like, for example, in genomics, it's not easy to define what is a concept. 
And so this is why in a few, a few months la later, um, after the publication of concept bottleneck models, a few scientists pro proposed um, a, an approach for overcoming this, uh, like the, 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 the accuracy explainability trade-off. And the, the idea was like, this is the description, like a, a sketch of what a concept bottleneck model is. So you have your concept space in the middle. And what they tried to do was to increase the capacity of this network. And they introduced a few extra neurons, like the yellow ones in the middle, um, which are not supervised with concepts. They are f like the network is free to encode in these neurons all the for all the extra information um, it feels that it's necessary to solve the task. And this approach improved the accuracy of the network, but for example, it dramatically destroyed the power of intervention. So the communication with humans, because now humans can play with the concepts, the, the, the neurons representing concepts, but they do not have a way to interact with the, this extra unsupervised capacity. And when they play with the neurons, uh, the, the concept neurons, um, they, they, they do not have, like the interaction uh, is um, it doesn't have any effect in changing the, the, the prediction of the model, meaning that the, the model is learning the concepts, but is not using the concepts, in fact, to make predictions. It's just using the extra unsupervised capacity. Uh, so we are back to square one, where we have concepts without, like, without any uh, thread, please. Yes, J just a comment. If you come back on the previous slide, when you say unsupervised, it's not directly unsupervised because you get the supervision of the classification. So it's the intervention is is not as you do on the concept, but still the network is getting some supervisions for for the task. Yeah, yeah. it's not like um, you're correct. This is um, what I meant with unsupervised. I meant that the, the neurons of this layer are not specifically supervised with. Uh, with concepts. So they do encode some information, but the, the information they encode is pure information coming from the supervisions uh, from the tasks. Uh, while the other neurons encode, potentially encode both information, and information about the concepts and information about the task. And this is why we proposed concept embedding models to solve the accuracy explainability trade-off in, in concept-based models and to, um, to maintain the, uh, the ability of these models to interact with humans efficiently. And this is more or less the architecture. Now, now we are going to, to, to break this in, 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 in steps, um, but you can see from this architecture already that the concept bottleneck, um, in the concept bottleneck, you don't have, ec no, you don't have um, unsupervised neurons, all neurons in this uh, bottleneck are fully supervised, like there are no extra neurons not representing any concept, but um, a concept now is represented by a set of neurons instead of just one. And the way, um, like step by step, the way this architecture works, it first maps the input into um, a set like an, 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 an embedding H and then um, it uses two functions uh, to encode the concept. The first function is encoding a presentation of the concept uh, when the concept is active while the second function um, provides a representation where the concept is inactive. Then we have a scoring function that takes the full representation of the concept, both like both the neurons representing when the concept is active and the neurons when the concept is inactive and predicts the activity of the concept. As, as for like, like up to here, we don't know whether the concept is active or not, or not. We just split the representation in, in, in two sets of neurons. Now here we can compute a loss on concepts. The scoring function maps the embedding of the concept into um, a scalar between zero and one, 
and now we can compute like which represents the probability of the constant being active or not and we can use this uh, for um, compare the predictions of the model with uh, the supervisions of the concept and we can back propagate this information now the step after this is to take the neurons we 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 use that we we split the split of neurons and the first split would be uh, multiplied by the probability of the concept being act active and the second set of neurons by the probability of the concept being inactive so now we have representation uh, of the concept uh, the act of the activity of the concept and we encoded this in this information into um, multiple numbers like uh, if you imagine like when the when this architecture is trained at convergence um, you will have that the probability is very close to one or zero so the effect of multiplying these uh, the values of the, uh, the activations of these neurons with the probability or one minus the probability would have the effect of masking out drop out the um, the, 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 the embedding that is encoding the wrong information. Like imagine uh, you have a concept that is being read and the probability is very close to one. So when you multiply C plus for one, it's just C plus one, while you multiply C plus for one minus one, uh, then it's zero. So when you add up, Again, these two embeddings, you get a, a single representation for this concept that is encoding the, mm, the, the Boolean, uh, almost Boolean, like here it's fuzzy, but at convergence is very close to Boolean representation of whether the concept is active or not, but it's sure. doing it in a, in, a, in a Latin space, in a high dimensional uh, space. Pietro, sorry, this is Marco. Just a curiosity about you know splitting uh, the concept into active and non-active, and correspondently the probability. How is the probability P one cap determined? Uh, it's computing using the probability is computed using a scoring function. Is a scoring function is modeled in our architecture with. Um, a linear layer um, with a sigmoid activation on top. So he, in this case, in this case, this layer would have four inputs, the four neurons of um, of input, and one neuron as output with a sigmoid activation. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Just a technical question here um, on the C1 hat, the, the output of this, the, the, the last representation, uh, when you said it's binary, uh, what you mean is that this vector is actually an embedding of the concept. The binary process is before that filtering between C plus and C minus, right? The, 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 the final embedding is not, uh, it's uh, not binary. binary. No, it's, it's, it's not. Uh, because phi, the functions phi that generate the concept C1 plus and C1 C1 minus is again these are like linear layers uh, with like ReLU activations or any activation y you like. The only constraint is having an activation where you can compute the probability on the scoring function. But in general, C1 plus and C1 minus are real numbers. So the output of this like C1 hat at the end of this uh, process. Is still a real number but in this real number we have encoded the information where the concept is true and when the concept is false and like this is the full architecture and given this representation now we can solve the task if we compare the representations we have in different architectures um, and we take a an architecture that is not using concepts at all. Um, we have that like, in the latent space, we can still, uh, in an unsupervised way, look at clusters representing concepts. And these clusters, um, like these concepts, would be represented by uh, real numbers. Uh, in concept bottleneck models, 
the representations of the concept is ex explicit and the representation um, of a concept is um, with a, a single number between zero and one. We need to encode the information of whether the concept is active or not and what's the probability of the concept being active. While in concept embedding models, we have a representation uh, of a concept that is still a real number, but it's a composition of two vectors, one representation where representing the true state of the concept and the other representation representing the false state of the concept. And when we look at the um, the embeddings for our test set, and we, we had a look at um, the concept embedding, concept bottleneck models uh, with extra neurons, um, extra unsupervised neurons, we, we saw that um, the activation, like the samples having a concept um, active or not, are scattered. They're, they're, they are not grouped um, in a meaningful way because the information is diluted in, in one single uh, neuron while there are extra neurons encoding all the rest of the information. While Pietro. in, yep. Pietro. Uh, I'm just curious about, you know, the, the kind of representation that you get when uh, the concept is not active, right? Because uh, regardless of the concept, uh, one may <clears throat> be induced to believe that uh, when the, a concept is not active, uh, a sort of uh, nil-like solution uh, may appear. I mean, something which uh, is not really distinctive of the specific concept, or uh, e this is not the case. And uh, uh, when you, know, you say, you talk about the representation of a concept uh, which is not active, different concepts develop uh, a different representation. Yeah, um, in in the current architecture, like this is a discussion we had during um, the development of this model. And um, as for now, the architecture we proposed has for each concept a, dif a potentially a different representation for when the concept is inactive. But you're right that um, it might be the case that um, a, a, bet, like a more stable representation could be achieved when uh, you consider um, a unique embedding for when a concept is inactive. Yeah, like, anyway, just, yeah. Just, just a comment, but of course in that case, yeah. uh, that would become a bit trivial, right? Yeah. Um, but still, you can like in even even in this case, when you have even if you have just one representation for when the concept is inactive, you can still have multiple representations for different concepts when they are active. Yeah, of so, course. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, just uh, just to point out, um, I think it's uh, um, still. Uh, a concept may be meaningful when uh, um, it, it's not active. So uh, we thought that uh, um, since we are multiplying the uh, embedding uh, uh, by uh, the scoring function, and uh, if we are not, let's say, having uh, as, uh, an embedding for the negative concept as well as for the positive concept, what would uh, result is that uh, uh, when multiplying the scoring function for um, the a positive embedding, when the embedding is uh, when the, the scoring function is zero, all the information that is related to a certain uh, concept uh, would be lost. So um, basically, what we thought, and 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 I think also we we see an improvement of the accuracy. Correct me, Peter, if uh, if I'm wrong, um, is that. Uh, um, uh, there is still much information um, that the network can encode uh, regarding a concept being uh, uh, inactive. Uh, and therefore, we end up with, uh, with this solution that allow us to uh, still have, uh, still provide to the label uh, predictor um, some information about uh, uh, the, the concept being inactive apart from uh, a, a nil vector, a, a zero vector. 
just a small question. For my understanding, so, so I understand you represent the, 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 the concept with binary representation, whether the concept is active or not. I was wondering if, if there was any interest in going in the direction of some other symbolic representation where you have three values, which is it is known, it is unknown, or it is known it is not here. So you have the yes, no, or unknown. So it's no. Yeah, it's also a discussion we 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 had during the um, the, the work we did. Um, thank you for the comment. Uh, and it's definitely interesting. We we didn't go for that for this specific work because the community uh, was already struggling with two representations uh, of the state of the of a concept. But it's definitely something um, that would deserve more exploration in, in, in the future, definitely. Especially in contexts where the information about uh, the concept space, uh, the concept uh, activity is unknown, um, as you said, yeah. And finally, uh, the results. Um, the, the results uh, we, we obtained uh, showed that the model, like at least for some data sets, the probably one of the at least for the most challenging data sets data set we designed, um, the model we 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 developed uh, was very close to the optimal compromise. So in the top right corner, where the explanations are are good, and the accuracy of the model is almost as good as um the one of a of a end of an end-to-end -end model without using that is not encoding any concept in an explicit way uh, and this is the main result probably uh, of of our work but there are additional benefits of using um a, an explicit concept embedding one is that it's applicable it's more easy to apply these kind of um, models in, in the real world. Um, in the sense that even we, when the, the number of concepts uh, for which we have supervisions uh, is very low, or when the um, concept labels are really noisy, concept embedding models are able to, um, like they drop a bit in performance, but not as much as um, concept bottleneck models. They are really robust to these noisy settings. And uh, the, third, the third result was that concept embedding models um, ha have uh, the same property of concept bottleneck models uh, in interacting with, the hu with humans. Um, using this uh, representation uh, where the concept can be either active or inactive, the human can change the probability of the concept, just the probability, and this has a, um, a large effect on the predictions of the model. So just by fixing the concepts, the label predictor uh, is using this uh, updated information to correct the predictions, as in concept bottleneck models, uh, which makes these models um, useful in scenarios where uh, you, have, you need an interaction uh, with with a with an expert that is providing uh, an an external supervision at test time. So uh, that's the end of the talk. Let's uh, first uh, sign the speaker. And now we can have a session of questions uh, uh, in the room remotely. Uh, 